Good morning. Good morning. So today is Mother's Day, and what a special day it is for all of the moms. Motherhood is, a, uh, is such a big responsibility and a great passion. Uh, you know, I think we would all agree that had it not been for our biological moms, uh, stepmoms, foster moms, adopted moms, all the women who, who built us up and, and who poured into our lives, the spiritual moms, the aunts, the grandmothers, without them, we would not be where we are today. And so even though we should say it all the time, and we should. Uh, we hope that you hear us loud and clear today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we celebrate you uh, on this day. But at the same time, we recognize that for many, for many today is not the, the happiest of days. For some, you know, just you woke up and you, you didn't want to get out of bed today. Perhaps you were torn whether or not you wanted to come to, to church this morning because it is Mother's Day, and we're glad that you, you did. But I'd like, to, I'd like to begin today by reading a, a, passage, <clears throat> of, uh, a passage titled, uh, The Wide Spectrum of Motherhood. This is written by uh, Amy Young. Here's what she writes. To those who gave birth this year, to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the path of infertility fraught with pokes and prods and tears and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, uh, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate you. And to those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who, who lived through driving tests and medical tests and the, the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you longed for it to be. To those who, to those step parents, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both uh, expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart. And we have some real warriors in our midst, don't we? We remember all the bombs out there. Will you pray with me? 
God, we give you thanks for mom. We give you thanks for all the moms out there, and we celebrate today so many women that you have placed in our lives, Lord. We thank you for how they have exhibited your character and how they have loved and how they have nurtured and how they have cared for us. We are so thankful for the ways, God, that they have instructed us and corrected us. We are indebted to all that they have done to make us who we are. And at the same time, God, we know that this day carries many emotions, Many feelings, many, many experiences, uh, memories, not good with it. We remember all the women who long to be mothers but struggle to conceive. And while we pray that the Lord, that you, God, would give them the desire of their heart, we reject the notion that they are anything less than in any way because they are childless. And we lift up those women who are estranged from their, their, their own children and, and those who have lost a child. God, we know that only you can bring joy from those situations of grief and mourning. And so, Lord, we pray that it would be so. Lord, bring healing to those who have been wounded or abandoned by their mothers. You are near to the brokenhearted. We believe that, God. You care for us. And so, Prince of Peace, we ask that you would come and you would bring comfort to all those who mourn. We know that you weep with those who weep, that not a tear falls that you are not aware of. And so, for many, God, today is this day of deep sadness over the loss of a mother. God, we give you thanks for all the women who have raised us, all the women who have spoken truth into our lives, all those who have come around us and been a mother uh, to us. We rejoice in you, that you, God, no matter what our experience has been, you, God, are enough. You, God, uh, provide all that we need for today. Lord, speak through me today. May my words be your words, and may we see you clearly through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, today's message is hopefully an encouraging one, uh, not just for moms, but for um, all, uh, all of those who are running on fumes. Okay, all those who are running on fumes. Today's message is called Running on Empty. And, uh, and I know, believe it or not, I know what you are thinking. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Um, you know, I, ladies, I can read some of your minds. And uh, what you really want for Mother's Day is a nap. It's a nap. Amen. Yeah, I know, right? Save that pasta necklace. Give me two hours uninterrupted, <laughs> right? <laughs> I appreciate the honesty in your thoughts, all right? I appreciate that. Um, but seriously, though, today is for all the weak and the weary. Today is for the stressed and the distressed, the exhausted and the empty. And if that is you, if that, if that is you today, man, I'm glad you're here. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. And so uh, let's open the word of God together. Uh, we're going to go to the book of 2 Kings. I, I need to warn you, you're not going to see the words on the screen today. You're not going to see any slides today. There are some Bibles under the seats. I know that's a real bummer, but hey, uh, I believe God's going to do something through, uh, through our time together today. Uh, so don't let that be a hindrance to you, um, you know, that, that the slides aren't on the screen today. But uh, you're gonna you're gonna find Second Kings. Um, you're gonna find Second Kings in the Old Testament, right after First and Second Samuel and First Kings. Uh, feel free to use that table of contents if you need to. Uh, but again, there are some Bibles uh, around here um, in each of the rows. There, I think. So uh, we're gonna go to Second Kings chapter four, Second Kings four, beginning in verse one. Hear the word of the Lord. One of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, 
Your servant, my husband, has died. You know that your servant feared the Lord. Now the creditor is coming to take my two children as his slaves. Elisha asked her, what can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? She said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go out and borrow empty containers from all your neighbors. Do not get just a few. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into all these containers. Set the full ones to one side. So she left. After she had shut the door behind her and her sons, they kept bringing her containers and she kept pouring. When they were full, she said to her son, bring me another container. But he replied, there aren't any more. Then the oil stopped. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. You and your sons can live on the rest. Thanks be to God for his word. Allow me to to set the scene here. The kingdom has been divided into two. There's Israel in the north and and Judah in the south. And it's during this time that we, we read that the Lord sends quite a number of prophets to those kingdoms. These prophets of God are sent to deliver the messages of God. And so at the beginning of 2 Kings, we read about uh, a man named Elisha serving under the uh, authority, under the leadership of Elijah, okay? Elijah and Elisha. In chapter 2, however, Elijah uh, is taken up into heaven, and Elisha succeeds him as prophet in Israel. And so his ministry is relatively new. It's it's just starting. He will be prophet in Israel for 60 years. Uh, But uh, we read in this passage that one of the wives of the sons of the prophets, that would be uh, one of his his servants, uh, cried out to him. And so what do we see in this passage? We see that, that her circumstances are bleak. This woman's circumstances are bleak. In despair, she cries out. She cries out to Elisha. She says, your servant, my husband, has died. You know that your servant feared the Lord. Now the creditor is coming to take my two children as his slaves. This word cried, this word cried uh, means to moan and to weep uncontrollably, to be so overcome with grief that you shriek out in pain. This is a broken woman who is at her wit's end. Some of you know what it's like to hit rock bottom. Some of you have experienced unspeakable pain and sorrow. And some of you can look back and uh, say definitively, that was the lowest moment of my life. This is where our story begins. We aren't told of what happened before things went south. We don't see how great things used to be. We don't see a certain lifestyle. We don't see certain things. We assume that they were, but we just don't know how good they were. Uh, Only that things were better then than they are now. All we know is that this moment right now is the worst for this woman. We're seeing this woman at the lowest moment of her life. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, look at all that's contained in that first verse. Her husband is dead. She had been married to one of Elisha's servants. Elisha knew her husband. He knew him. And he was training him to be a prophet as well. But now all of that has changed. Her husband is dead. And she is alone with two small children. 
Being a widow is difficult in so many ways. But it was especially difficult in biblical times. The the man was the provider and the woman was the one provided for. What is she to do now that her provider is gone? He didn't leave her large amounts of money. She's not sitting on a on a pile of cash. He was like the equivalent of a seminary student. There's no wealth. He's gone. The money is gone, and there's no way to get more of it. Women in the Old Testament, they didn't just go out and get a job. It's for that reason that we read in Scripture that we're to give special consideration to widows and orphans. They're both in the same category as far as God is concerned. She has no capacity to make money, and she is drowning in debt. She can't pay her bills, and as a result, the creditor is coming to take her children away as slaves. According to the law, children were considered property of their parents. And the law permitted parents expressly uh, to sell both themselves and their children. When a debt was owed and a debt couldn't be paid, one's children could be taken as slaves to, to work out the debt. That's why we see the year of Jubilee every seven years where where the slaves get released. Their children, their family members, their moms and dads, they're working off a debt. However, this widowed mother, she has not offered her to sell her sons into slavery, but the creditor has demanded them as payment. He's on his way to collect. See, most of us know emotional pain. Most of us know financial pain. But only some can know this maternal pain. This woman has birthed two beautiful children. She has rocked them to sleep. She has fed them. She has changed them. She has bathed them. She has dressed them. She has sang with them. She has taught them, just to name a few. And now, they are about to be taken away. Only moms know this kind of maternal pain. I know that we said it already, but but if you have lost a child, please hear me say that we grieve with you. And again, if you have experienced a miscarriage or infertility, we mourn with you. You may feel alone and unseen, but I assure you, God knows. God knows. What does he know? He knows you. He knows you. We aren't told this woman's name. She's never named I mean, some have suggested that she is the wife of Obadiah. We don't know for sure, but even then, we don't know her name. But it doesn't matter. God knows her. He knew her before she was even born. The Lord said to the prophet Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, before you were even born, I chose you and I set you apart. He knew who Jeremiah was going to be. He knew uh, what uh, what this child would be. He knew what this woman, he knew this, what this woman was, and he knew what you and I would be. Our lives are an open book before the Lord. He sees all, but he specifically sees us. God knows. He knows us intimately. She isn't identified in our text. Her name is not on this who's who uh, list of Old Testament uh, folks, but she is not unknown to God. 
Each of us is personally known and personally loved by God. We are the personal objects of his love. The psalmist says that he counts the number of the stars and he gives names to all of them. And he, he, at the same time, the psalmist says elsewhere in Psalm 50 that he knows every bird on the mountains. He knows all the creatures of the field, they belong to him. So what makes us think that he doesn't know us? We were made in his image. He has cattle on a thousand hills. Oh, but he loves you and me. He has cattle on a thousand hills. The whole earth belongs to him, but we have his attention and his affection. Psalm 8 says, When I observe the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him, a son of man that you look after him? David, he he looks up to the stars and he sees all these stars that, that again, God knows the exact number and he's named all of them. Named every single one of them. And that's his response. Who am I? Why? What am I that you know me? And you look after me. See, God doesn't just know us. He knows our struggles. He knows our struggles. And some of you, some of you can relate. Some of you can be described as a grieving widow or widower. Some of you can be described as a slave to debt. Some of you can be described as a fearful mother. Some of you can be described as being at the end of your rope. Some of you can be described as running on empty. While I doubt that anyone has, anyone here at least, has experienced heartache exactly like this woman, exactly like it, every one of us is mourning something. Every one of us is mourning something. The loss of a relationship, a wife that died. A husband who says, I don't love you and wants to get divorced. The loss of time together. Your your preteen is no longer sweet and cuddly. Your son got married and moved away. Financial loss. You were laid off from the job that you held for 30 years. That investment that you thought was a sure thing was anything but. Bills keep on coming, but you can't pay them. And the price of gasoline went up, so you can't fill up your tank. The price of groceries went up, so you can't fill up your cart. The loss of hopes and dreams. You had high hopes for your family, but your home is better characterized as a war zone, yelling and screaming seem to be a daily occurrence, Uh, peace cannot be found, patience is in short supply, and you think to yourself, I never dreamed it would be like this. We're all mourning the loss of something. This mom, she's at the end of a rope. She doesn't know what to do. She has lost so much already. Hope is nearly gone. The stuff of this life is closing in around her, and she doesn't see a way out. The waves are up to here, and she doesn't know if she can make it. She is tired, and she is sad, and she is mad, and she is scared, and she is alone, and she runs up to Elisha, and she just spills it all. She spills it all. And everything that comes out of her 
Everything that she had been storing up inside, everything that she had hidden from the world, God was aware of. He knows. He knows every tear she has cried and rest assured, he knows every tear you have cried as well. The next thing we need to see is that every trial is an opportunity for faith. Every trial is an opportunity for faith. It doesn't matter what season of life you are in. Every trial can be an opportunity for faith. How will I respond when things get tough? Just like the the wine-making process, there is one way and one way only to find out what's inside. Squeeze, to press, to crush. When I am pressed, what comes out? Is it faith I mean, this woman, she needs help. She needs help, but she doesn't run to her family or friends. She, she runs to the Lord. She doesn't try to find someone who can loan her more money. Money isn't going to solve this problem. In her desperation, she turns to the man of God, the prophet Elisha, for help. She cries out to him, and Elisha responds by asking her. He says, he says what can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? She responds, nothing except a jar of oil. Let's pause for just a moment. I want us to think about this. Elisha has heard her speak. He has heard her say how bad it is, but he wants to know more. And so he's like, I know you've lost a lot, but what haven't you lost? What do you still got? Let's start there. And she says, I have a jar of oil. Either Elisha has the greatest poker face in the world, or he has the greatest faith that God can meet this woman's every need. Because upon hearing her response, he doesn't laugh. (laughs) He doesn't go, yikes. I mean, anyone else might have just turned and walked away. (laughs) What, What can you do? I mean, what can you do, right? She has what is the equivalent of a a flask of oil. See, a jar is probably overselling it. Some translations even use uh, a a phrase called a pot, a pot of oil, uh, which in my opinion is going (laughs) really in the wrong direction here. Uh, This jar of oil was uh, enough oil for one person, enough oil for one person for one anointing. This, this would have been similar in size to that, to that flask, that, 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 that jar of spikenard that you read about in the New Testament, the perfume used to anoint Jesus. The oil was used, this oil that she had was used for anointing the body after uh, bathing or, or uh, to anoint the dead. So some, some think that this widow has held on to this, <clears throat> to this pot of oil. She's held on to it because it's for her burial. As in, the only thing left to do is die. As in, this is it for her. She has one foot in the grave, but despite her pain, her problems, and her lack of possibility, she was still looking to God for the help that she needed. And we know, and we know that Elisha, it's not his poker face, right? He has the greatest faith. Uh, He is a man of faith, and he does not laugh. He doesn't say, hey, sorry, sorry, lady. I I can't help you. No one one can, all right? Um, He doesn't doesn't send her away. And as we've said before, little is much in the hands of God. Little is much in the hands of God. And Elisha knows this. Elisha knows this. 
He, I, I mean, it, this is the equivalent of, of you know, uh, God saying to, to, to Moses, hey, what's that in your hand? A staff. David looking down and realizing he's got a sling and some stones. It's enough. A little boy has a lunch of fish and some loaves. It's enough. And so Elisha says to her, go, <laughs> go, go out and borrow empty containers from all your neighbors. Don't just get a few. Then go in and shut the door. Shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into all these containers. Set the full ones to the side. Even though she couldn't see a way out, she knew that she couldn't see everything. I'm sure, I'm sure there was a part of her that was like, okay, okay. So you want me to borrow empty jars? from my neighbors. I mean, let, let's face it. These are very specific instructions. Very specific instructions. I mean, so specific. I mean, one might even say that they are unique instructions. There is no way that she could have fully understood what Elisha is telling her. I mean, she has never heard of such a thing happening before. We have never read about it happening before. Uh, you know, her neighbors are probably like, man, she has really lost it now. She's come, she's come looking for empty jars. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. But this, this is what faith looks like. She believed what the man of God has told her and she responds in faith. Let me ask you, why would God, why would God have her go through this? I mean, couldn't God have provided for her without her oil? I mean, it's all she's got. Of course he could do it. He doesn't need her oil. So why was her oil required? I mean, it would have been easier uh, if, she, if she didn't have to go borrow jars from the neighbors. This act alone would have many of you feeling uh, some kind of way of going to the neighbors and asking for their empty jars. But why involve oil in jars at all? Why involve the neighbors? Here's why. Just as the struggles were personal to her, so was the solution. The solution to her problem was personal to her. Oil was all she had. She didn't need, uh, he, God doesn't need her oil. She needs the oil much more than God does. She needs that oil much more than God does. But when oil is all that you have, will you withhold that oil from him? Will you withhold that last thing, the only thing you got left? Will you keep it from him? She believed the prophet, and she had faith that God could do this, but her own oil, I mean, it's on the line here. It's on the line. In some ways, this is akin to the widow's might that we read about in Luke chapter 21. When oil is all that you have, will you keep it for yourself? This is a very personal miracle. 
She's told to go inside with her sons and shut the door behind her. Again, God could have done this miracle without the jars and without the neighbors, but the jars belong to the neighbors. And because the jars belong to the neighbors, the neighbors would then be able to attest that these jars were indeed empty and now they are full. They were empty and now they're full. See, emptiness is not a problem for our God. It's a prerequisite. I mean, mean, don't miss this here, right? Emptiness is not a problem for our God. It's a prerequisite. It's the only thing required. The world says that emptiness is the problem. Oh my gosh, I'm empty. Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? All right? They say, you aren't enough, but God says, I am enough. They say, hey, you know, you don't have enough, but God says, I will provide enough. They think that emptiness means that you have nothing, but emptiness with God means that you have all that you need. See, emptiness isn't the problem. It's a part of our circumstances. Emptiness isn't the problem, though. Our fullness is. I mean, notice here, our fullness is the problem. As long as we are full of ourselves, we are not full of God. Or or to say it a different way, as long as the the space is taken up in my life, there's no space for God to pour more in. There's no room for God to fill me if I am full. Charles Spurgeon, he once said, it's not our emptiness, but our fullness which can hinder the outgoings of grace. I mean, think about this. If this woman's pantry was full, if her pantry was full, then we would never, this, I mean, this whole, this whole story, I mean, we wouldn't even be talking about it. If her pantry was full, praise God that her cupboards were barren. She was quick to obey, and man, the Lord was quick to provide. It says here, after after she had shut the door behind her and her sons, they kept bringing her containers, and she kept pouring. They kept bringing the containers, and she kept dumping it on in. These, I mean, it's just a, a constant flow, right? The oil, it just keeps coming out and coming out and coming out of this little flask. Don't miss this, friends. Don't miss this. We may feel empty, but our God, he is never empty. He is never empty. We, we receive from his fullness. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I'm full. It doesn't matter. We receive from his fullness. We may be lacking, but he is never lacking. He is never lacking. And he is happy to meet our needs. Emptiness is the only prerequisite here. It's the only qualification, right? If you are empty, you are pre-approved. So you're like, man, I've never been pre-approved in my whole life. That's awesome. I'm pre-approved. Hey, if you're empty, you're pre-approved. It's not your merits. It's not your ability to pay it back. I assure you, this is not loner oil. It's not loner oil. God isn't like, hey, you know what? I'm going to give you this. Uh, it'll be like a little down payment, and you, know, you pay it back as you go along. It's a gift from God to you. It is a gift, and that is a good thing because we have no ability to pay it back whatsoever. But that's the beauty of it. It's the grace of God. If we have nothing, if we have nothing, then we are eligible for everything. Our emptiness makes us eligible to receive from the Lord. Empty hands get filled. As long as we have needs, God will provide. The oil, it stopped flowing when there wasn't another container to be filled. (laughs) It says here, when they were full, she said to her son, bring me another container. But he replied, there aren't any more. Then the oil stopped. When the need ended, the provision ended. The provision stopped when there was no longer a need to be met. Not a second sooner. Not a second sooner. 
Just like the Lord provided manna every morning, every day for the Israelites, he will provide your daily bread. As long as you need it, the Lord is happy to provide it. And so for all of you, whether you're moms or not, for all of you who are exhausted from caring for others, all of you who have been, uh, keep, uh, you, you've been, you're, you're, you're running on empty. I, I, I can't give anymore. I've already given it all. Keep giving. For all of you who are exhausted caring for others, keep caring for others and God will keep caring for you. God will take care of you. Keep emptying yourself in service to the Lord. He is more than able to fill you back up. He is more than able to fill you up again. Do as Jesus did. Jesus' fullness, his fullness wasn't seen in his appearance. But it was the way in which he emptied himself. The way in which he emptied himself. For uh, love's sake, he became poor. His humility wasn't seen until he was seen serving others. His wisdom wasn't seen until he poured it out in, uh, through teaching. His power wasn't seen until he poured it out through miracles. His love wasn't seen until he poured out his blood on the cross. Your emptiness and my emptiness, they aren't a problem as long as we know where to go to be filled. We have no need to store up for ourselves. We have no need to build bigger barns. Emptiness isn't the problem, but fullness is. Could it be Could it be that the problem is this? The problem in our churches, the problem in our homes, could this be it? Perhaps God hasn't filled our churches because they're already filled with the satisfied. They're already filled with the self-sufficient. They're already filled with the self-righteous. As one scholar said, a full Christ is for empty sinners and for empty sinners only. As long as there is a really empty soul in a congregation, the word of God will go forth as a blessing, but no longer. The flow will stop. When the need is gone. What about in your home? Is the power and presence of God evident in your home? Perhaps God hasn't moved in because there's no room for him. Our lives are too full. Our schedules are too full. We're not desperate enough. But there is good news. There is good news for the weak and the weary. There's good news for those who are tapped out on time, drained of dollars, and emptied of energy. For those who have spent their sanity for the sake of others and especially the moms on Mother's Day who continually pour into others, keep pouring. Keep pouring. Our God is faithful. As long as we faithfully empty ourselves, God will faithfully fill us. Don't be afraid to empty yourself for a God who can make you full again. Will you pray with me?
God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that your word is alive and active. We thank you, God, for your word that it speaks to us and teaches us of your character. God, we ask that you that you would meet each of us here, right here, right where we are. That we might trust in you and not in anything else. That we wouldn't look to our circumstances. We wouldn't concern ourselves with the things of this world, but God, that we would seek to empty ourselves. That we wouldn't store up, just as the Israelites stored up, <clears throat> tried to store up manna, just as they tried to keep it for a rainy day. Lord, your, your mercies are new every morning. You give us daily bread. So God, just as we read in this story here, may we, may we pour ourselves into others. Lord, don't let fear overcome us. But let us follow the example that you have shown. Lord, may you be seen. in our lives. May people see your love through how we love others. May they see your sacrifice for how we sacrifice for others. May they see your power for how you have changed our lives. May I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.